Please enter at your own risk. There are no refunds. Conditions may include low light, no light, strobe effects, Y reality, beads, alcohol, flowers, broken glass, broken bones, broken dreams, exhilaration, disorientation, ecstasy, self-knowledge, and death. Flash photography is permitted. Remember to be aware of your surroundings. Your surroundings are aware of you. Welcome to Dark Factory. enticing way to kick things off. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm going to turn it over to you, Kathy and Nathan. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. So it's exciting to get to talk to you about this book, Kathy. Uh, and uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about first, because I think that trailer makes it quite clear, uh, but also when you pick it up and, and page through it for the first time, what is immediately clear is it is not structured like a traditional novel. Uh, and uh, you, when, you know, it, it has the traditional narrative, of course, but, but around that you have, uh, there are pictures, there are interviews, there are uh, little character sketches, there are uh, lyrics from songs, all kind of interspersed throughout the text. And uh, which can be, which kind of augment the story, but don't have to necessarily be read uh, where they appear in the actual pages. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, first about a, just a, a general idea of what Dark Factory is and what is it about the story that, that necessitates or at least asks for this kind of unusual structure. Well, that is the best first question of all, Nathan. And I am not surprised. I have to say on a personal level, I am very happy to be doing this with Nathan because he is one of the coolest people ever. So you already know that if you are an Asheville person, but if you are not, now you know it. Um, the, idea, the idea behind this book came, uh, everything I do comes from a character. And so Ari Reagan was the, the viewpoint character and was my, my gateway drug into Dark Factory. But as I was working on it and pulling in all these different, it's set in a club and there are these uh, performers and then there's kind of a guy who is completely against the club and all these things are happening and the DJs and the art and all the people who go there. And I felt like the cartoon character who is jumping up and down on the suitcase, trying to fit all the things in the suitcase. And I was not able to close the suitcase. And so... I thought, okay, this is diff this is a different format than any I have ever worked with before. And I'm gonna have to do something different to get everything in there because trying to do it as a traditional linear narrative was not cutting it. Uh, there was no way for you, because as you pointed out, there are these, there are lyrics, there are interviews, there are, there was backstory, there was magazine stories. And to try to tell all that in a linear way would be exhausting. It would be like trying to carry all your groceries without a bag. I mean, you just can't do it. 
And so Trisha Reeks of the Mighty Meerkat Press and I devised the, the container, if you will, for the story. And so if you wish, you may read only the narrative, you may ignore all the sidebar stuff, and you will get a perfectly good night at the club. If you want more, there is more. If you want to go further from what is in the book, you go to darkfactory.club where there is a ton more of information and backstory and art and bespoke graphics and posters that were created for the, I almost said for the show, but for the show, for the story. So it just keeps expanding and expanding because the idea of, of immersion in, in performance and in life is that all these things are happening all the time, all around us. And we are kind of curating our own reality by deciding what are we going to pay attention to at any given moment. So that was that big idea. I've heard you mention uh, elsewhere that uh, the character of Ari, who is pretty much our, our, our primary protagonist, uh, was originally, and maybe I misunderstood you, uh, but was originally uh, part of a different story and, you, and he wasn't quite fitting. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? He was, and this was something I was working on during the, the run-up to the plague. And it was a, a piece of fiction I could not make work. And I kept trying and trying and it just wasn't coming together. And I was very unhappy with it. And he was the only thing, and he was very peripheral to that story. But when I took him out, he just flowered and he brought everything in with him. And so it was clear that he was struggling to get out of a, of a place that he didn't belong. And I've had that happen once before um, with the cipher. In fact, my first novel, Nicholas, mm -hmm. the protagonist of that story had been part of something else I was working on. Same deal. Couldn't get it to go. Couldn't get it to run. I took him out and he just brought all this other fun hole madness along with him. So it, it's interesting in a way to see that Number one, I clearly don't learn. <laughs> from, I don't. I don't always see the signs that are there uh, in a in a flowering narrative, but that when I do, everything becomes very easy. And I think, in a way, that's kind of what Dark Factory is about as well. Is this when you are operating in a state of flow, right? You are not struggling. You are not scratching your head. You're not, you know trying to say, why doesn't this thing work? Because it does work. And sometimes it works so well that it's almost frightening because it, it has a very propulsive life of its own. It's interesting because I've had characters before uh, which I thought were going to be minor ones suddenly just kind of assert themselves in a way that I wasn't expecting and, and change the narrative around them. But it never occurred to me to lift them bodily out of that story. And maybe they have a different one to tell. I'll have to see if I can experiment with that sometime in the future. And it's so strange to think about how so much of what we're doing is such a mystery to mm -hmm. us as much or more than to anyone who will ever read it. It's just a mystery. And the more you surrender to that and let that flow take you, the better things always, always invariably become, but it's difficult to know sometimes where that flow is. Or if you're, if you're able to access it, the, because this whole project was so different than anything I've ever done, it took me a good deal longer to get it started. But once it went, it just kind of went like a bomb and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I kept telling Trisha, I'm done. I swear to you, this, this is going to be it. This is going to be it. And then there would be more. And I'm like, all right, I'd lied, but I'm almost done. And, and that is not a way that I work either. Usually I am pretty A to B. I, I don't all, I never know where I'm going, but I know that I'm going to get there in a reasonable amount of time. And this was completely different. So, so, so how long did it take to write? And, and what is your, how long would you say an average novel takes if that's even a possible question to answer? Right. No, a, a normal book generally doesn't take me longer than a year 
depending on how much, depending how ignorant I am when I start of what I'm trying to write about. So if I have a lot of research to do, it might take longer, but it almost never takes longer than a year. And this thing, at least three years, maybe three and a half years, I have some proto notes that are almost four years old. And it's like, whoa, this was, it had its own gestation and it really was its own thing from the very beginning. Well, it's and I know this is a question that you've probably gotten several times and will get several times, but uh, I think it's kind of unavoidable. It's uh, it's uh, so it was it was begun then before the pandemic changed everything, uh, but of course it sounds like it was finished when the pan- pandemic was still or when it was just taking off, and because it's a book in which we talk about the flow and there's a, the question of uh, of what why is that I want to get to in a second. Um, but uh, because it's one that is so much about a communal experience and uh, and just the kind of the kind of space you can make with with a community that you can build around you. Uh, was it odd? I guess it must have been odd. How, how, how would you describe what it was like writing about something that was drawing so much so much power from the idea of community in a time when we are profoundly separated from community. And it did. And it, it struck me often, sometimes daily when I would be sitting down to work and the engine of this book is joy. Mm. And it was such, it was a time where there was so little joy to be had because we had the plague and we had all our myriad of problems and political disasters and everything around us was filled with tension and fear. And yet every day I was sitting down to write about kind of the opposite, right? To write about connection in a time of loneliness and to write about joy in a time of of fear and uncertainty. And the irony was not lost on me, but I, I didn't understand sometimes how it was happening in such a such a split screen way, right? But there I was at the desk every day. And like we do when we write anything, right? You're trusting the text to get you through. It's like, I'm investing everything I've got in what this is trying to be. And I have to trust that it's trying to be something and let it go. But it was, it was an odd feeling, especially because I was doing a lot of sidebar research as I went on about DJs and about, you know, the, and keeping up with what was happening in the club world during the plague. And so many people suffered in a lot of different ways. They suffered the loss of their livelihood. They suffered, you know, the closing of clubs. But what everyone missed was the connection. And it shows more powerfully than anything, having gone through this we know we are people who need people. I mean, we need to feel that connection to feel completely alive. I think there's an appetite for that kind of thing right now too, specifically because of that. There's this kind of a, there's this, uh, this is sort of like common wisdom that in dark times, you know, dark fiction tends to do well. Uh, and I think that might be, have been largely true, but it seems to me that there is also a flip side of that coin when we're seeing a lot of our popular culture kind of embrace much more uh, positive and, uh, and, and optimistic kinds of fiction. Um, and I'm thinking of some uh, television shows like Schitt's Creek and, uh, and the one whose titles I'm, I'm blanking on, but about the soccer player and uh, or soccer coach in England. I can't remember. What it's right, called. right. But you know what I mean, and uh, and 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 these things, which are largely about just finding joy, finding some peace, are are really hitting something. Uh, I think some f- fulfilling some kind of need, and it seems to me that Dark Factory, uh, will is 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 aiming at that same target. Absolutely, and the the kind of the irony of the title, um, one of the characters, Max, brings it up because Max thinks about everything and Max would be the one to bring it up. But he he points out that the term dark factory is often used to describe a robot workplace where there are no human workers, 
mm. because you don't need to turn the lights on. You don't need to. Why would you? You know, people, the people aren't there and the robots are just doing their duty in the dark. But that whole idea of if the world is a dark factory, you know, let there be light. We need to find out. We need to be able to see what we're doing before we can do it effectively. And we need to feel we need to feel that we have enough vision to continue what we want to do. And that, again, that title was not consciously chosen because we were going into this tunnel life for two years and counting, but it works really well. If, if everything around us is, is dark and confusing, uh, we are working to turn the lights on, to get some autonomy back, to get some momentum back and to really make a world that will help us make ourselves. If that's not, if that's not stretching the factory metaphor too far. But I remember learning about that, that whole concept of the idea of a robot workplace, which is really desolate feeling if you think about it. I realize they're just machines working in the dark, but they're just machines. We're, I mean, do we want to be just machines working in the dark? No. You know, we want more out of being alive than that. Yeah, there's something very eerie and, and sad about that image, I think. So one of the things that they use uh, to kind of to kind of to generate light and to kind of generate this sort of energy is uh, something called why. Um, can you talk a little bit about why and what role it plays? It's in the, in the story, it's an augmented and customizable reality. And depending on your desire and your ability to access it, you can, when you're in the club, you can have a lot of things happen to you. The menu is very long and they can be uh, fun sexual encounters with people who don't really exist, or they can be, you're seeing visions that the tech artists are creating or there's all this kind of cornucopia of fun that's available to you. And I did a lot of reading as well. You can imagine about VR and AR and trying to see where is that industry and where is that art form going now? And it is moving so fast that no one can, can get ahead of it because it's, you know, it's continuing to unroll like a carpet, right. As it, as it rolls out of sight and we're kind of chasing it. And it tied back into the idea that we have to make our reality and there are, are tools that we may use and, and augment like that, like why tools and toys that we might use to maybe just escape a reality that we don't want to deal with. It's like, I'm going to go to the club and I'm going to, you know, fuck some magical creature and have 10 drinks and dance. And that's going to be great because that's going to take me out of whatever I don't want to be in right now, whatever I don't want to deal with. And that's kind of been the promise of the club anyway, right? Is yeah. you go there because you want to get taken out of yourself. You want to have, have fun. You want to dress up. You want to see people you haven't seen and listen to loud music and let go. One of the things I think is interesting about that is that, so you have got, there are a few principal characters, but I think two of the, two of the main ones are Ari and, and, uh, and Max. And, uh, and it was interesting to me the way that they come at this in the beginning, kind of at loggerheads, very different ideas about, about uh, how to create these, uh, these experiences or these places where your experiences can be, can be had. And, uh, and I found myself in the beginning, and this, this is why I think the thing with why is interesting and why, and, and, and why the this positive spin on what wise possibilities are is interesting because my sympathies in the beginning were more in line with Max's who uh, was suspicious of all this and, uh, and, and was much more, much more interesting, interested in, in, in reality, not this kind of manufactured reality for lack of a better phrase. Um, when I think of virtual reality uh, now, I think about, I think about a darker aspect. I think about the way it's not, it's kind of like, I, well, it's potential to kind of corrode the communal sense and to, and to kind of like, we, you know, we kind of get on these, in, these kind of deep dives into our own interiors and, in you know, it kind of like it can feed a kind of narcissism. 
And it was interesting and kind of refreshing to, uh, to see this this other possibility for it, this this uh, this this different this different take. Um, when you were writing this, how to phrase this question? Uh, was it intentional to have that sort of like diametric opposition in the beginning of them, in in the big with with these two characters about this? Was that why that that opposition was there? Was that a question you were interested in exploring, or was it? A little more, I guess, was it different or more abstract? That was a clumsy question. I apologize. No, 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 no. And I'm trying to think of the, in a, in a large sense, it's organic. And in the largest sense of all, when I put, when I see these characters, I, I first saw Ari, but Max came very quickly and they were always in opposition, right? They were always, and they are very much two sides of the same coin. And yeah. because they both have a very strong idea of what reality can be. And as the, as the book goes on as well, we learned that Max used to be a gamer. Max used to be very emotionally invested in playing games and in augmented reality and why that changed. And, but that Max is so interior and Max is so, Max questions everything, including himself multiple times. And he is always turned inward and trying to get to the bottom of experience. And Ari is completely the opposite. Ari is outward facing. Ari does not ask why. Ari just makes the thing. And it would be, it was inevitable that those two were going to clash in some way, but they're also so very much alike because they're both trying to do exactly the same thing. Right. And eventually if you are working hard enough on something and you dovetail with someone, whether or not they get on your nerves, you are going to fly because you're both pushing so hard and so well, and they're both operating, you know, at the top of their game, they cannot help but achieve something together. And early in the book, Max is, is, is a little leery of, uh, leery is putting it, it mildly, right? He, he, <laughs> he believes that on, on one level that whatever Ari is going to set out to make, he's going to make. And Max is not sure if he really wants to be, a, you know, along for that ride. But yeah, it's downright hostile. It, it, it's inevitable though, right? Because he can't, you can't help being who you are. You can't help wanting what you want. And he really, really, really believes in creating a reality that is immersive and is inclusive. And so does Ari in the end. And so, yeah, they... They were fated to be besties. So yeah, they're both interested. In, they're both pursuing this 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 same thing. And this is something that I think I. This is tangential to something that I've, like I've been reading your work for uh, for, a, quite some time now, and your work has uh, changed a lot in certain aspects uh, over the years. But in certain ways, there are certain there are, there are particular themes I think are relatively consistent. As with you know, as with most writers, and I think it's interesting that uh, the characters, the protagonists, in in many of, uh, if not all of your work, uh, are typically either flirting with or in direct pursuit of the numinous, of some kind of like a spiritual uh, awareness or uh, transformation. Uh, transformation may be in the most extreme sense. But just you know, looking for something like they're pulled by something. I'm thinking uh, this. I think this applies to the cipher sure. uh, and the fun hole. I think it applies to uh, you know uh, Christopher Wilde uh, and the, the, the Christopher Marlowe uh, uh, under the poppy, and especially not especially, but I I always come back to the first story I ever read by you, which was a story called Angels in Love. Mm. Which I think came out. Was it 91 or thereabouts? Long time, but, yeah. But it was this, uh, it was a very dark, uh, unsettling, and yet, and yet surprisingly, shockingly beautiful story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think the same kind of energy is driving Dark Factory. You know, I think, you know, when I think of uh, the hum, uh, is the hum something that you can talk about? Yes, there, there's a there's a moment in the story, and you're you're perfectly you're 100 percent right. There is 
there's always this drive towards that numinous or in whatever way it's interpreted by you know characters it, it's very different from book to book but that drive is still there and whether it's expressed in a destructive way or in a creative way is you know up to them but the the hum is actually it, it was amazing as well as I was working on this things that I thought that I was making up actually all turned out to be true and the hum is is one of those things one of the characters in the in the book a DJ after a particularly numinous rave on the roof finds that he is able to hear and experience sounds in a different way and they all seem to be part of one sound and it's all happening all the time and there are people for some people don't like it they find it very intrusive or you know upsetting but there are people who will tell you that very same thing right now and that they are investigating this hum that appears to be universal and global and it's it is out there so finding out about those things was very comforting in a way because it felt like I was on a breadcrumb trail. It's like, okay, so this is really a thing. And some of the things that I'm having happen in Y reality are things that are being talked about in AR and VR and ways to present things or ways to perform or, so it was like, okay, I'm on kind of a wide road. I can't see it all, but I'm following something. And I think we have all had experiences where we felt to an unusual degree that feeling of there is something bigger and I'm part of something bigger and it may go by in a flash. It may be, a, you know, if all your hair may stand straight up, you might, you know, run out of a room. But I think we've all had that and we tend to, or even, you know, it's handmade in coincidence everybody, every single person has had some unexplainable coincidence. And rather than say that it's an unexplainable coincidence, it could very well be part of a, you know, of a very different order that we're just not apprehending yet. Things are always so strange until they're not, right? And mm -hmm. then you say, people talking to each other through computers, that's crazy talk, you know, and then but here we are, right? And it, it happens. So I don't, I think in that sense, the numinous is very close to us all the time and it's part of our experience. And it, it's, it's particularly interesting, not because it's something out there and you know unreachable, but precisely because it isn't, because right. it's here all the fucking time with us. Do you think, uh... Do you think that, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me rephrase this. So in Dark Factory, uh, there is one of the characters at one point mentions uh, Andy Warhol's factory, uh, which uh, got me thinking about, you know, it's, you know, these, the way, the way uh, these two characters are kind of, they're not DJs really, uh, but they're sort of artists who are trying to create something almost like, a, almost like an installation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it got me thinking about, uh, you know, your work, uh, Christopher Wilde, which is Christopher Marlowe. And, uh, and I, I, what, what relation do you think artists have, if any, or uh, with, with this kind of, this pursuit of the, of the numinous, for lack of a better phrase? I think that if we're doing our jobs correctly and staying as open as we can to possibilities, the same way we would as being people in the world, I don't know that it could not, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't confine it only to artists. Those are the people that I write about because those are the people I understand, but I would posit it for anyone and say, if you are an athlete, if you are a physician, if you are a researcher, you are going to come to that edge more often than not and feel those possibilities that are present to you that you just have to stretch a little bit to achieve or not achieve is the wrong word to, to become part of or to unlock or to, yeah, that's bad too. <laughs> <sighs> to merge into 
because it's there to contain what you're doing. The a research you're making a breakthrough, right? You have tipped into, if that's not the numinous, I don't know what is, right? It's like you are suddenly thinking differently and you're seeing something differently. You went out to investigate and the answer was there. You didn't have to create it. It was there, but you had to find it. And part of its, its genesis was in the finding. If you had not looked, it would not be found. So that, I, I really strongly believe that this is part of everything that we are and do. And there is nothing, you know, woo about it. It's, it's there like oxygen and we just have to open ourselves in various ways. Something else that plays into into the idea of the of the of the spiritual space uh, are the masks. Uh, they play a major role uh, in the story, and I think at one point, uh, it was either in the, in the novel or in one of the interviews on this on the website. Uh, it was someone mentioned that mask as itself a kind of sacred space, and uh, yeah. and I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about masks. And what, how they, how they affect Dark Factory, and in the in the story, there's a moment where a mask comes into Ari's possession in a way that he doesn't expect and doesn't even invite, and in fact refuses in the beginning and says, "No, no." But the the woman is quite insistent. She says, "No, you must take this. You know, this is for you." And his Felix, the DJ who can hear the hum, ends up wearing it at this extremely numinous rave. And that's when he begins to access these, you know, these sounds and the idea that everything is, is connected musically. And the, the horned mask itself is very old symbolism, right? It's very many, many, many cultures have it. And it's often a symbol of fertility or of ecstasy and you know you go out in the woods and you put the mask on and you can do all the things and you're also freed because any mask anyone anywhere i mean that's what halloween is about right you are you become something else but the thing that you become is almost so laughably you right you very rarely choose a costume that is totally not you and if you think you do you haven't you really haven't you feel, and we even see it in, in, a, in an awful way, an ugly way online when people hide behind, you know, personas and will do and say atrocious things that if they had to have their name underneath where their mom and everyone can see, maybe that would rein them in a little bit. But the mask is that ultimate free space where you can allow yourself to do things or become something for good or bad that for whatever reason with your real face, you're not gonna do, you don't wanna do. And I've seen this in my immersive, uh, the performances and installations that I've done. If you give people a mask, they will, some people will not accept it. And some people will take on, they'll be delighted and they will take on all the freedom that it offers and act accordingly. And doing those shows in a lot of ways was like, watching someone read one of your books, right? In real time, because you could see their reactions to the various parts of the narrative. And a lot of times it was nothing I could have predicted. And that was, that was the fun, right? Yeah. So I wanna make sure people get a chance to hear you read before we open to, for Q and A, but I did wanna ask you one more question uh, while there's time about, you mentioned installations. Uh, I know that you do, uh, theater work and have been doing uh, that for uh, several years now. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, why you started that. And, uh, and, and if, if there's a, a way that you've noticed, I think it clearly has influenced Dark Factory, but, uh, but if there's, you know, beyond Dark Factory, if there was a way you've seen the kind of influence of these two different modes of expression kind of push and pull against one another. I think they're really the same. I mean, I have found them to be the same. I started doing it because I had done a, uh, invited some artists to collaborate with me on a book trailer for the first Under the Poppy book, which takes place in a Victorian brothel and involves puppets. And so we had a blast making this shadow puppet brothel. And I liked it so well that I thought, well, I, 
because I, I do believe in pleasure and joy and fun. And if you are really having fun doing something, that is something you need to continue to, to do. So I learned more about immersive theater, which this is about 10 years ago. So it was almost 12. So it was a, quite a new term, you know, especially in the States. And I was, was learning as best I could how to make these performances happen and how to take a site and turn it into this kind of seamless or as seamless as possible uh, experience for people who came into it. And the more I did, the more I realized it was completely like writing a novel. It's, it's exactly the same, except they're not reading it, they're walking around in it. But same deal, what is interesting and exciting to one person will be off-putting to someone else. They never engage the way you think that they will. They always have their own agenda and they always make the experience work for them. And I can't think of a better way to define fiction. I mean, every time we write something, we're having a conversation with that reader alone. It's just the two of us. And the thing that we're creating together is unique to our conversation, right? It's and with another reader be different, another reader, another reader. And that's why it's so great when people get together in book clubs and go, ah, you know, I thought this and I felt this and I, everyone has recreated it on their own and watching uh, an immersive performance or an installation was that in real time, was watching people create the experience, the idea for themselves. And one of the extraordinary things about this is getting back to uh, one of the things we talked about at the beginning is the website. You, Cause you, you kind of have created an environment where people, they can't literally walk around in it, but they get to continue to live in it. It's not just the story in the book, but uh, you have on the website, you have uh, playlists, you have a graffiti wall where people can write whatever they want. You have continuing stories. It was a, kind of remarkable. I saw, you know, there's stories posted there with a byline by one, characters from the books. And then there are posts. There was an interview with you posted with, uh, with someone else. And the, the person who posted it was one of the characters from the books. So it gets really kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you, the line gets gets very much blurred about what's real and what's not. And it seems to be uh, a very, uh, an active and evolving environment even now. Completely. And that's why uh, real people are interviewing not real people and not real people are being interviewed by real people. And we have invited, um, we had a mask contest a little bit earlier in, in the book's Genesis and people responded by making these incredible beautiful masks and all all different very different from each other but it is it exists as a space right for people if you would like to add a song to the playlist um, we will very shortly be offering a fan art contest if people want to we've made a very broad definition of art so people will be invited to do that and I would love to see people come into this space and start making it their own that would be chef's kiss that was kind of the point, right? If you if you open a club, you really want people to come to the club. That's the truth. So I should shut up now and let you do a, a reading so people can hear part of this book. Well, here this is this is I chose this with you in mind, although I did not know that you were a Max partisan when I chose it. But it is very <laughs> much about it is very much about Max coming to this is Max coming to the Dark Factory Club for his first kind of backstage visit, and Ari has hired him to be kind of a, uh, an observer and to give a critique of this club. And so Max arrives and here, the brusque blonde handing Max a sealed bag with a t-shirt and generic tag. You're in what, QC? You get your real name tag by end of shift. I'll take them now from the doorway. The blondes nod in sudden full attention. Oh, sure, Ari. As Ari in silver buccaneers earring in full factory black, leads Max away from the HR intake room. And because he has to say something, Max says, gulag match, ID anafacial match, just to get a t-shirt and thumb sign the NDA. I wasn't planning on disclosing any of your trade secrets, but yeah, I signed, noting that everyone they pass, the performers, the support staff, I'll offer Ari that same quick deference. He cannot keep from asking, why are you asking me to do this? Paying me to do this. A lot of people must want a gig like this. 
and you don't. I want to see what you see. I told you that already. You can change in there and leave your bag, nodding to the performer's lounge and lockers, then leading a highlights tour of the floor, all the floors, the bars and drink stations, explaining the DJs and dancers deployments and the usage of the tiara. Set it however, just make sure to bookmark your settings. As all around them, the feeling escalates of clockwork chaos ticking towards performance. Max knows that feeling, but never at this scale like diving from a pond into the ocean. He swallows the questions he cannot ask. And after your shift, Ari says, come find me in the box. What the fuck is the box? But Ari is already leaving, joined by a pair of floor runners, while a tone like an enormous plastic bell makes the whole building echo as if something vast has been struck into life. Then the lights change, the patrons start to enter, the night begins. And despite his best or worst intentions, Max launches himself into the midst of that crowd, determined to keep his eyes open, stay on top of whatever will happen here tonight. But almost immediately finds himself enmeshed, fly and honey caught and caught off guard by the constant shift and self-perpetuating level of detail, the sheer strength of the peripherals the haze of it, the maze of it, the see-through ramp that spirals up in a fog of scents like floating flowers, the room filled with hundreds and hundreds of wax candles with flickering flames indistinguishable from true fire, except they burn nothing, exist as nothing, but light that does itself not truly exist, their curling smoke never touching his lungs, as he struggles to find his mental footing or at least map the spatial layout, how big is this building anyway? What floor is he on? The one with the room full of graffiti? Did he already pass this upside down bar or are there two? And in this bewilderment is just a symptom of his self-imposed refusal of why, the tech expanding since his gaming days. He has always been high presence, what some people call susceptible, but he never expected to feel so agitated here, so very unhappily good. As he makes his way through that crowd, those human moving parts all part of a greater whole, most of them loud, some of them laughing, some of them obviously junked or drunk, wandering from dance floor to splash booze, to flashed ass, to fake fuck, to who knows what. He wonders what menus they have chosen from that tailored sidebar cornucopia. Where do they intersect with his reality? Do they see him as a blur or an effect or as himself or as nothing at all? Then the first floor DJ blasts a manic fusillade. He feels it in his chest like the whole world might be breaking apart. And the three dance floors go simultaneously, blindingly silver as the crowd cheers for the light, for the beats and for itself. And the silver dissolves like ice and sunlight. The Y dials down and down and disappears as the house lights rise, rosy and resistless. As all around the crowd leaves, a noisy moving mass, then pairs and trios, then stragglers on the ramps, then gone. And Max tugs off his tiara, feeling all his senses disengage at once, feeling how leaden his body actually is, how pummeled and sweaty, meat reality. And now Ari sees him, emerges to lead him not to the performer's entrance, but through a different set of doors marked not an exit, into chilly air that smells like lager and dumpster reek. And so, Ari says, lighting up, first impressions? It's not what I expected. That's not what I expected to hear. You didn't find anything to hate? Wait, Max shaking his head as if to clear it. Give me a minute to bring Ari's measuring smile. I'm hungry. Get your bag. Come on. Fantastic. You can see that they're just meant to be together. They're so good together and they're so, so different. I had a lot of pleasure in watching that particular friendship unfold. 
throughout the, the course, spoiler alert, but they are so, they've already been on the same page for so long, it is kind of inevitable that they end up making the story together. You can tell when you read it, you can tell that they must have been a, a lot of fun to write. <laughs> so we should probably open up to Q&A. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but we, so we should cede it to the people who want to ask questions. For sure. Thank you. Uh, what a great conversation. Um, thank you both so much. And we do have questions. So we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, thank you folks for asking questions. Please don't take it personally if we don't get to yours. Um, but, uh, but this has been such a great conversation. And I think that you've actually covered some of the things that were on people's minds, you know, as, as they were asking as well. Um, so we'll start with Charlie, who said, Kathy, of, of all of the arts, why did you pick Dan? as a centerpiece for Dark Factory? Um, I think that when you are in the club and you are on the floor, nothing else is going to lead you over that lip of experience like the beat. And it is, it's the most physical and yet the most cerebral thing you can do is kind of let the thinking mind go and surrender to that music and to that beat. Great. Um, we have a question from Mike that's for both of you. You did actually talk a little bit about writing process at the beginning, but this is a chance um, specifically for you, Nathan, to chime in and for Kathy, for you to, to add anything else that you'd like to add. Mike says, has your creative process changed at all over time or has it stayed more or less the same? And if it has changed, how so? Nathan, Nathan do you want to start? Uh, sure, uh, it has. Uh, it, I, it used to be really haphazard. Uh, I used to be one of these people who would just wait until I felt motivated and moved to write something. I thought that was the way to to get the purest stuff. And then I realized that it, that it, I was wrong. Uh, the way to get it is to dig for it. Uh, and I it took me a while to learn that ideas beget ideas. And if I don't know what to do, I should just write and then just by operating the machinery and getting it to work, ideas will come. Um, and so I'm a little more disciplined uh, than I used to be. I'm not as disciplined as I should be, but more so um, because I know that's how it works. That's how you get ideas. You just have to work. What he said, uh, I used to think too, that you just kind of sat there and waited and stuff would come. And then I realized if you are not sitting there, number one, nothing will come because you're not where you're supposed to be. And so writing every single day um, is the discipline that I put on myself. And that was what enabled me to get things done because there will be days where we will sit there and nothing will happen, but at least you're sitting there. Yeah. Yeah, great. And then that actually uh, segues into a question from Mark um, for you, Kathy which is how do you balance a big long-term project like Dark Factory with other creative work? Um, I did not. This was my life. This was my life. Um, good good you know, honest I answer. I started working on it. Um, and especially because a lot of our launch events that are have begun and are ongoing are also uh, part and parcel of it, but they're also their own thing that have to be. I, yeah, this is what I've been doing for the past three years and in, into the foreseeable future. So I also know that when I'm working on a, a book or a show, I need to focus on that thing. And I try never to, to do multiple projects at a time for that reason, because I, I really need the focus to make sure I get the thing where it wants to go. And doing two things at once is not my forte. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I, uh, we were actually just talking about this recently, Patricia and I, the, the myth of multitasking, um, you know, and how we, you know, we're uh, a lot of times this idea is put on us that we, sh that unless we can do several things well, all at one time that we're somehow, you know, not managing our time wisely or not using, you know, not using our talents, talents properly. And I think sometimes that's just not true, right? You just need to, you just need to do one thing at a time well. Um, and often, you know, one thing actually has so many facets that, you know, that's, that one thing is more than one thing. So then trying to add 
more things on top of that is, you know, can be untenable. So that's a, that's a, I feel like that's a great thing to be aware of. So thank you for, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, what about you, Nathan? I'll just, I'll just pivot a little bit and ask you, do you find yourself working on more than one thing at a time when it comes to creating? Do you have more than one idea that you feel the need to, to flesh out, you know, simultaneously? I do. And I'm taking notes, listening to Kathy, because, uh, I often have, uh, like five or six different things that I'm excited by and they're taking me in different directions and I'll try to give time to each one and I end up not making any progress anywhere and just feeling frustrated and locked up. Uh, and it's only when I put things away to say, it has to be just this, that I'm able to actually make some forward progress. So when Kathy said that just now, I was like, yes, I better, I better hold to that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a writer, but I feel that just in life in general, you know, trying to spread your attention usually just ends up with a lot of mediocre results instead of, <laughs> you know, one good one. Um, so um, Mike has another question, which is um, Kathy dark factory calls us to reconsider what a novel is and what a novel does. And you've spoken to this a little bit, but I'd love to hear what else you have to say. Um, the second part or the question really is what do you, what do you both see? Um, so I guess it's for both of you. Great. Um, for the future of the novel, nothing like a, you know, a quick little question for the last right. five minutes. I probably should ask that one first. <laughs> what do you see as the future of the <laughs> novel and will it stick or will it stick around as a, as a relevant art form? Wow. That's deep. I think, um, also, you're yeah. doing different stuff with novels, right? So, yeah, there's a lot there. That's the, and that's the thing. I think it can. I think the novel is not what we need to think about. What we need to think about is story. Mm. And I think story is infinitely elastic. Story can be verbal. There were verbal bards being incredibly pissed off because people were writing things down. And if you are writing them down, you are killing the, the momentum and the spontaneity of them. And you are ruining the story by writing this shit down. And then we started writing this shit down and we found out it did not kill the momentum. And it, it gave us a different way to offer stories to people that might not ever hear us as bards because we're dead and they're alive. So they could read books. I think this is a to be able to integrate into narrative, written narrative that also contains other things, I think the novel will be just fine. And the, the boundaries will continue to expand as they need to and be like those, those little cartoon amoebas that just you know eat different things as they go along and become more interesting and, and complex. I think, which is not to say that writing a perfect haiku needs anything but being a perfect haiku. But I don't think it has to be either or. I don't think we have to say the novel is this, the same way that we don't have to say a book is this, a film is this. It can be many things. And once I, you know, that goes back to that suitcase metaphor, trying to smash everything into this linear narrative and it clearly wasn't working. Once I let the, the narrative take its own shape, it became a lot easier. And I think that is available to anyone. Anyone who feels, I, I do an immersive fiction class. And one of the things I ask the students to consider is there any complementary art form that might enhance what they're doing? Maybe yes, maybe no. And there's no right or wrong answer, but it's a way to think about that. And they have come back with some amazing ideas and some of them are traditional and some are completely not. So narrative can continue to take any shape it pleases and it will, it will be the better for it. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think she's exactly right. I think, uh, I think the novel as it stands today is not going to go anywhere. I think it may not, it already doesn't take center stage in the you know, public consciousness anymore, but that's fine. I think novels will be around just like poetry is still around. Um, I think uh, I think people are more interested in in participating in narratives uh, these days. I think some interesting like video games, things like uh, where you can be in a world and be actually an active participant in the story. I think those are getting more and more sophisticated, and I think that's can go very interesting places. Uh, but as far as yeah, as far as what the future entails, I I would never 
I'd never be so arrogant as to guess, but I think I think I agree with Kathy Koja that there there's always going to be narrative. The story is not going anywhere. Thank you both. Um, this is going to push us over a couple of minutes, but I, I want to go ahead and ask this last question um, from Polly Chattel, who's a writer and a filmmaker here um, uh, in Asheville. Um, hi, Polly. And uh, Kathy, about your YA fiction, do you feel the same need to pull readers into an immersive literary experience as you do with the more adult oriented work? Oh, sure. I think I think it would be almost uniquely beneficial and fun to one of the things that I loved best about writing YA was the your your readers were already aware that they did not know everything. Adults are equally in that boat, but they are often unaware that they don't already know things. And so they were a completely open and fearless group of readers. And I think immersive fiction is perfect for young readers and even for little readers where we all come from the land of make-believe and we are perfectly at home there. Nothing feels weird to us, right? It's only later when people go, I can't see your imaginary friend. You think, oh, shit, all right. You know, so I, I think it's a natural way too for us to tell stories and to be immersed in stories. So absolutely, Polly. Yeah, that's such a great point too. When you think about what will just come out of like a four or five-year-old's mouth, uh, you know, <laughs> just in terms of whatever it is there. It's sort of like watching your cats when they look like they're on acid, right? It's just, mm -hmm. it's, you know, and you're just like, wow, why can't I be there wherever, <laughs> wherever that little kid is right now? Because uh, that's amazing. Um, I, I want to do one more thing because you two haven't been, um, uh, been privy to the chat. I want to give a shout out to our audience, A, for asking great questions and B, for the fact that in this, in this event, we have had references to uh, David Bowie, uh, pro wrestler Dusty Rhodes, um, and uh, Schitt's Creek and Ted Lasso. That's the show you were thinking Lasso. of, Nathan. I'm also going to put in a plug for The Good Place if people are looking for some, uh, some feel-good TV. Um, and with that, I will invite both of you to give us any last words before we say goodbye to our audience. I just want to thank Nathan first and foremost for the, the elegance of his questions and the warmth of his presence. I'm delighted to be able to take part in this tonight. And I invite everyone not only into Dark Factory, but into this larger world of play and immersion. And I think we should all just go nuts. <laughs> and I just wanna <clears throat> just say the Dark Factory is a beautiful book. Uh, I think it's doing important work. I think people should jump in. And I just want to express gratitude. Uh, Kathy, thank you for letting me be part of its debut in the world. Uh, it was an honor. Thank you both so much. And thanks to everyone who's been with us. We appreciate all of you. This, is, this has been a lovely hour. And we encourage everyone to pick up their own copy of Dark Factory and check out the website. And we look forward to seeing y'all again soon in whatever form that might take. Um, <laughs> and we hope that you stay safe and well until then. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks.